Um, so we have a pretty small group tonight, but we're going to get started. Um, and I think a few more people will probably join us as we go through. Um, so I think if you want to, you can turn your camera on or leave it off, um, but maybe just type into the chat um, your name and your kind of affiliation if you want to, um, what brought you here, whether you are a farmer um, and your location would be great. And, and I'll do a super fast intro because we have such a small group. Um, yeah, and so thanks. Uh, this year, the sessions were organized by SPEC with support from, oh, I'm also gonna keep an eye on the waiting room. Hi everyone, we're just getting started. Um, so yeah, the, the sessions this year were supported by the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program under the BC Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, uh, UBC Community Engagement and the Vancouver Foundation. Um, I think I've you've probably met most of you here, but um, I'm Georgia and I coordinate SPEC's Farmland Ecosystem Services Project and I work really closely with SPEC's food team. Um, uh, which have uh, monthly meetings, which I would encourage you to drop in on sometime if you're interested. Uh, and I do wanna let folks know that the session is being recorded and we're planning to make it available on our website. So if you have any concerns about this, you can let me know. I'll put my, um, I'll put my email in the chat so you can see it. Um, yeah, so I think mostly it will be Aoni speaking with some questions, uh, but do let me know if you have any concerns about that. Um, and this is the second of three online workshops we're doing this year. So um, the next one is next Wednesday, the 6th, and it's in the morning from 9.30 to 11. Uh, we have a special session for uh, biological and organic flower growers in the kind of Metro Vancouver, Fraser Valley area, though everyone's welcome. We have uh, a consultant named Ellen Polishuk, who uh, is joining us from Virginia. And we're gonna get nerdy about soil specifically for flower farmers, but she's also a soil specialist and can answer other questions as well. Um, today, we're speaking with Ioni Smith about climate-friendly farming. Uh, Ioni is a professional agrologist with a background in community engagement agricultural planning and land resource science. Uh, she has over 17 years of experience uh, has, and has built a career on developing innovative agriculture and food security plans uh, and climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies, as well as farm business plans. Um, so I'll let her introduce herself in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, Oops, I, this is Ioni with a photo that I stole from. That's with Instagram. Bobo. His name's Bobo, that pig. He's, he's a thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> um, yeah. And so this is our next, our upcoming session with Ellen uh, next week. You'll, I'm sure you'll get an email about that, a reminder. Um, and then as we did last week, I also wanted to just acknowledge that um, I'm greeting you as an uninvited guest from the unceded territory and homelands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people in what's known as Vancouver. Um, I wanted to just share a couple of 
resources about indigenous food systems uh, on the slide here. So this book here, you can see um, food plants of interior first peoples, Nancy J. Turner. I just got the, the version of this for the um, coast, the south coast first peoples. Um, and it's a really, really incredible book with this really interesting information. I grew up here, but really have had very little education about how Indigenous people use the land for food systems. Um, and there's so many common plants around us uh, that have been used for um, millennia. So encourage you to explore these resources. Also found this really neat resource um, from the Vancouver Island Community Research Alliance around uh, indigenous foods on Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, this is another document that was on the Kwantlen website, uh, just noting some of the uh, different plants that were commonly used by Vancouver Island um, and some Coast Salish groups. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any other kind of uh, resources on Indigenous food systems that they have explored and found really helpful, I would encourage you to put that into the chat. Um, but as I mentioned last week too, I just encourage us all to think about whose land we're on um, and which which communities we're serving through our work, um, whether it's growing food um, or other work, and perhaps how we can support Indigenous initiatives uh, and work to benefit Indigenous peoples and lands um, that we live on and rely upon. Um, And last, uh, this is our slide about SPEC. So most of you are, are probably familiar with SPEC, but we've been around since 1969. Um, we are very much a volunteer driven organization and do education research and advocacy focused in these areas. Uh, so I work really closely with the food team but there are really active uh, volunteer teams in these other areas as well. Um, and it's a really warm, welcoming and supportive group of people and also teams. So if you have an idea that you would like support on, I would encourage you to uh, explore SPEC's different teams. Um, and I can put some, I'll put a link to, um, uh, to SPEC's website in the chat as well. Yeah, so I think um, without further ado, I can pass it over to Ioni. Um, and uh, as if, or I think Ioni will cover this too, but if you have questions through the, through the webinar, just put them in the chat. And um, if Ioni doesn't see them, I can kind of holler for you um, and let her know. So welcome and thank you for joining us, Ioni. Great, thanks, Georgia. Um, should I share my screen now, even if it's gonna make me pay? Yeah. yeah. So th thanks so much, Georgia, for inviting me. Georgia and I have known each other for a while now, and um, it's great to see that SPEC is continuing to do these workshops, these sessions. I think they're really valuable for the community. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's great that we're a small group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my slides. It will probably take about 20 minutes and then hopefully we can use the rest of our time for a bit of a discussion. Um, as Georgia mentioned, feel free to put any questions in the chat. And if it's something that's, you know, specifically you need clarification on, also don't be shy to unmute yourself and just speak up. So the session tonight is called Climate Friendly Farming. Um, what I'll do is just briefly introduce myself and then talk a little bit about the food system, but not too much because my guess is that you're all pretty familiar with it. I'll go into some of the climate change impacts with a particular focus on this part of the world, so the lower mainland of British Columbia. 
Um, and then kind of turn from that negative sort of doom and gloom piece to talking about more regenerative agriculture and ecosystem services, and then specifically things that can be done on the farm um, for building climate resilience. So as Georgia mentioned, my name is Ioni. I'm a professional agrologist. I started Upland Agricultural Consulting in 2009. I'm also working currently as project manager for Farmland Advantage, which is a program with uh, the Investment Agriculture Foundation focusing on development of ecosystem payment for ecosystem services programming on farmland in BC. Um, I teach at SFU through the Community Economic Development Certificate Program on food systems and community economic development. And I'm currently the vice chair of the Agricultural Land Commission um, and have developed the Green Bylaws Toolkit along with Deb Curran, um, did some webinars with her earlier this year. Just in terms of some current projects that I'm working on around Metro Vancouver, um, we're working with the regional government on exploring how ecosystem services on the agricultural land reserve could be better protected. We're also doing a project with the city of Surrey looking at how parks that are within the agricultural land reserve could be better used for farming. We are updating the agricultural plan for the city of Delta. And we're also working with the Ministry of Agriculture on a project that's looking at how better to steward agricultural water courses uh, throughout British Columbia. So those are some of the types of projects that our consulting company works on. Just as a brief um, overview of the food system. So this is a diagram that was developed by uh, the Central Okanagan Regional District, so I can't take credit for it, but I really like it because it specifically speaks to the British Columbia food system. And it also um, speaks to some of the more, the more indigenous <clears throat> layers of, uh, of our food system. And I think that we can, when we consider climate change impacts, we can really consider all aspects of the food system is potentially being impacted by climate change. So everything from pre-production, which includes agricultural inputs, traditional knowledge and farming practices, through to harvesting of um, forest, um, forest non-timber forest products or fisheries or farming, through the market supply chain, which we all know has been recently uh, very much impacted by climate change in BC, um, through to consumption and waste management. So we'll explore some of these during the presentation today, but I also welcome your questions about them. But I, I like this diagram in terms of food systems thinking and, and how it mentions that education, regulation, policy, research, and markets really have an overarching impact on these aspects. So when we talk about climate change impacts, the, there's five main things that in British Columbia in particular, we're talking about. That's the changing of the hydrological regime. So in other words, how precipitation is gonna change throughout the year. And what we're really speaking of there, particularly in the lower mainland, is the increasing variability of precipitation, such that at some times of the year, we're, we don't have enough water and sometimes the year we have too much. Those will also impact changes in potential pests and diseases within the province, as well as an increase in extreme weather events and an increase in risk of wildfire. So those are the five things that we are anticipating and we're already seeing in many cases. This is results of some research that was done by the BC Climate Agriculture Initiative, looking specifically at the Fraser Delta area. So um, that the Fraser Delta includes the city of Delta, Surrey, Richmond, and, and somewhat the township of Langley. And the results so far indicate that there are warmer winters, and so that results in less snow in the mountains. There are also warmer summers and less summertime precipitation. The salt wedge, because you don't have as much fresh water coming through melting snow and through summer precipitation, you have salt water from the ocean that's actually moving further up the Fraser Valley, and so the Fraser River, and so that's impacting the water quality that's used for irrigation of crops um, in the Fraser Delta. The seasonal flood risk is increasing, particularly in the fall and the winter. And so from 2000 to 2050, what we're expecting is an increase overall of annual precipitation, but it's going to fluctuate wildly depending on the um, season. So in the summer, we're expecting less rain in the winter more, and you can see snowfall is expected to drop by more than a third. On the flip side of that, so something that might actually be a benefit to agriculture is we're anticipating an increase in growing degree days. So growing degree days are simply a measure of uh, how many days above a certain temperature 
um, will be experienced with any given region, and that can be directly correlated to the types of crops and the yields of crops that can be anticipated. So we're expecting hotter and drier summers, that's not surprising, but what happens uh, when the, that also overlaps with the time of year when crops need water the most, then we have a real water deficit. And so more precipitation is going to be shifted to the winter, and that happens when crops are less productive. This map is um, from the province of BC, and it indicates the anticipated change in the amount of heat energy or the growing degree days per century. And so you can see the coast mountains and the interior, the southern boreal interior, have the most change uh, anticipated. This will result in different crop feasibility as well. So certain crops may be more feasible. Um, but again, really what we're concerned about here is water. So here's some images of what we've seen, right? Over the last few years, this is a, a photograph from a friend of mine who has a cow-calf operation just outside of Prince George. These were the fires basically in her backyard last year. We also are now all familiar with these horrible flooding images from the Fraser Valley. So this is the Sumas Prairie just this past November. And there is really a relationship between wildfire and flooding. And oftentimes the fires come first, they degrade the vegetation, the forests on the slopes. Um, and then when the rain falls in subsequent years, there's nothing holding the soil in place. And so there's much more likelihood of flash flooding, erosion and landslides. And so my biggest concern as an agrologist is this map here. So this is an aerial satellite image of um, the greater Vancouver region. So right here is Stanley Park in Vancouver, and this is where UBC is. Here's Richmond um, and Delta. And what you can see is the amount of sediment and soil this fall that got essentially flushed right out into the ocean. So we're losing our topsoil, we're losing our best soil. And that is of concern to me as much as any other impact of climate change is really this, this loss of our soil resource. To me, there's nothing stronger in our toolbox for climate resiliency than healthy soil. So these are the kind of images that, that really strike me. Um, one of the things that we can do to counteract some of the impacts of climate change, of course, is to focus on regenerative agriculture. You may have, sorry, I just knocked my water. You may have heard that term bandied about a bit. Um, so I'd be interested during the discussion to talk a little bit about the definition of regenerative agriculture with you. But basically, in my mind, it's um, exploring how agricultural practices have an influence on our ecosystem and on our ecosystem services. So what do we mean? When, when I talk about regenerative agriculture, I'm talking about these specific key actions. I'm looking at regenerative agriculture as being a vehicle for creating better habitat for biodiversity on farms, for improving water quality and for improving water quantity. So to mitigate some of the impacts of flooding on farms. I'm looking at regenerative agriculture as a method to reduce the threat of wildfires. And as I mentioned, my my pet issue is to maximize soil health. And more and more uh, various levels of government and researchers are interested in exploring how regenerative agriculture can result in higher carbon retention and sequestration. There are a host of ecosystem services that essentially benefit from regenerative agriculture. Ecosystem services are one way of exploring and explaining the benefits that people derive directly from a healthy ecosystem. So these are essentially non-monetary benefits. They're not traded on the marketplace. You can't really buy them, but they are things that we all benefit from when they're working well. So here's a list of some of the types of ecosystem services that I consider um, as benefiting from regenerative agriculture. First and foremost is clean air. That's important for everyone. Clean water and uh, also the mitigation of flooding. Wildlife and pollinator habitat. When we have healthy habitat on, uh, on farmland, we often have great pollinator um, great pollinator uh, biodiversity. Native grasslands, I mean, that's not so much something that, that, is, that we find in the Lower Mainland, but certainly in other parts of British Columbia, grasslands play a key role in not only wildfire um, mitigation, but also in soil carbon uh, retention sequestration. And then again, these all combine together around minimizing soil erosion and loss. Uh, so some of the things that benefit farms from protecting ecosystems which provide these benefits are increased pollination, pollination and biodiversity as well. So how can we 
work with producers, work with farm operators to explore these best practices that will, you know, serve to only enhance ecosystem services and under underscore and leverage regenerative agriculture. I've included a non-exhaustive list here. These are some of the things that we've encountered in our work over the last few years. So the types of activities that we are really promoting on the farm is to minimize the amount of tillage. So the amount of times that soil is turned up. So either having low till or no till uh, soil practices. Mulching is fantastic because it really reduces that soil erosion. Um, it, it enhances soil moisture retention and also organic matter production um, and percent of organic matter in, on farms. Grazing management is really important. You can actually use a herd of cattle or sheep or other grazers to um, minimize the, the amount of forest ingrowth and therefore reduce the wildfire threat to a farm. Cover cropping is also important as a way of mitigating soil uh, loss. Fencing, fencing is a great tool. It can be expensive, but it can be also a really important investment in a farm. And it can be used to keep um, livestock out of riparian areas and streams that are trying to, to um, create habitat, healthy riparian habitat. Alongside that riparian piece is the removal of invasive species, replacing them with native plants putting beaver guards around new plants so that and um, and new young trees along the riparian area so that they aren't taken out by rodents and also to stabilize riverbanks. Those are just some of the, you know, there's probably dozens, but those are some of the most popular and most common treatments um, that we've been promoting. I thought I'd dive a little bit deeper into this riparian ecosystem example um, before going into some tools uh, for farms. But basically, just to, just to reiterate that a lot of our agricultural land in British Columbia is located in riparian areas, and that's because 90 odd percent of our province is Rocky Mountains, <laughs> mountains that are covered in snow for most of the year. And so our fertile soil is located in these valley bottoms, so it makes sense they're adjacent to rivers or other water bodies. Um, they also contain some very valuable habitat for salmon and other species at risk. So often when we're working on farms with producers, we're looking at how we can best um, really make, how we can best support the riparian ecosystem to play the role that it needs to play. So this isn't a great image. I, I see it's a little fuzzy, but it's just a, a drawing to show you the difference between a healthy riparian buffer and an unhealthy one. So we're trying to move away from farming right up to the edge of a water body, providing buffers um, and, uh, and other tools. And the way that we can do that is through programs like Farmland Advantage. So I'll just spend a minute talking a little bit about the Farmland Advantage program. This is a program that's being administered by the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC. This past year, we had 48 sites across the province involved. We partner up with restoration organizations. So for example, some of you might know LEPS or the Langley Environmental Partner Society. They worked with us on seven sites in Langley. And we work directly with farmers. We provide the funding to do an assessment of the riparian health of the farm and uh, put together a prescription for what needs to be done to enhance the farm riparian area. And then we pay for the restoration work. And then over time, the farmers paid a stipend uh, to maintain the work that was done to restore the riparian area. So it's a way of really bringing farmers to the table as partners and as contractors to make sure that the ecosystems are maintained. I also wanted to talk about a few specific tools that are out there and available for farms of all sizes. So one, the first one I'll start with is at the federal level. This is a, a national organization called Farmers for Climate Solutions. They're essentially an advocacy group and they're really pushing for national policy change and looking to see nature-based climate solutions and uh, carbon reduction strategies embedded in national policies and budgets and any programs around COVID relief and uh, regeneration of the farming sector. They really focus on policy de development, but I highly recommend checking out their website. Their policy solutions page is very interesting. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot by getting involved in some of their work. The second organization that I wanted to highlight is the BC Agricultural Climate Adaptation Research Network, or BCARN, BC ACARN for short. 
So this is a network of collaborators, um, everyone from academia to producers, to government, to industry associations. Their focus is to advance research that will actually benefit farmers directly on the ground. So no longer just this idea of research for research sake, but looking at what are, what are the key problems that farmers are encountering with regards to climate change and how can researchers best assist um, these farmers in finding new tools to adapt and to thrive as a business. And then uh, the last, the, th the third that I wanted to highlight is the Climate Change Adaptation Program. This is another program that's now being run through the Investment Agriculture Foundation. This basically works with ACARN in bringing the research directly to the farm. Um, so there's best practices that are developed toolkits. It's really more um, specifically workbook based so that you can uh, take a look through all their regions, the issues and the resources and find some of the things that maybe your farm is, uh, is having problems with or, or encountering and find some solutions to some of those problems. I did um, put I did sort of link to this video. So I, I think if you'll indulge me, I'll just play the video for three minutes. Um, it's, it's not a very long video, but it showcases how to use one of the tools that they've put together, which is a project that I was uh, fortunate enough to work on called the Farm Flood Readiness Toolkit. So we'll see if this works. There isn't any sound so far. Maybe okay. Let's try climate. that again. I was playing, I could hear the sound on my end, but. Video provides an work? introduction and yeah. overview of the Farm yeah. Flood Preparedness Toolkit. This is one of two videos that accompany the toolkit. As the climate changes, BC is seeing more frequent rainfall, more intense rainfall events, and more rapid snow melt. This means more and more farms are at risk of flooding. That's why we've designed the Farm Flood Readiness Toolkit to help producers like you take action to prepare for flooding and to recover more quickly when it happens. The toolkit was shared with numerous producers and other technical experts who reviewed the toolkit and provided their input. Based on their feedback, we created a resource that can be easily integrated with your other emergency plans. Flooding is a specific type of emergency event. Thinking about the specific impacts of flooding and how to reduce losses will help you be more prepared, even if you already have an emergency plan. Developing a flood plan before a flood emergency happens will help you to communicate your plan to others, keep family members and employees safe, reduce damage to farm assets that are at risk from flood waters, be prepared to protect your livestock, be better able to act as a first responder, and to evacuate efficiently if necessary. Evidence shows that those who are prepared fare better. So what exactly does the toolkit contain when you download the PDF? The toolkit includes a series of eight fact sheets and eight worksheets organized around five key themes. The fact sheets are brief informational resources on specific topics. The worksheets are located at the back of the toolkit and correspond with the fact sheets. To make your flood readiness plan, fill out the worksheets that apply to your farm operation. The plan should be updated annually or sooner if your farm operation's key information changes. There are sections of the toolkit to assist you to think about flood scenarios for your operation, identify the areas and infrastructure on your farm that are most vulnerable to floods, understand your flood proofing options, plan for a possible evacuation, create a livestock protection plan, and to consider your insurance and risk management options. If you have livestock, fact sheet six outlines three options for protecting livestock, including sheltering in place and relocation. Worksheet F provides you with space to document your plan to protect livestock in a flooding emergency. Worksheet H serves as a template to draft a buddy or host farm agreement. Fact sheet seven describes the special considerations that dairy operations face. Worksheet G serves as an outline for milk share agreement. Download the toolkit by visiting bcclimatechangeadaptation.ca. To get going on your farm flood readiness plan, print a copy of the toolkit or work with the fillable forms on your computer to begin populating the worksheets. Walk your farm to do so. You can also watch our video, Protect Your Farm Assets from Flooding, 
That video explains how to identify and prioritize assets at risk and how to start planning to protect your assets. For help with your flood preparedness plan, contact your regional agrologist or local government emergency manager. So that shows um, just one of the tools that the um, that the Climate Agriculture Adaptation Network provides. There's a f there's tons of others, but I thought I would just highlight three here. Um, this one on the left is around managing for extreme heat impacts, and uh, that was another project that I was able to work on in 2018, 2019, and it ended up being very timely because of the heat dome that occurred last year. So. Some of the things we're working on are almost sort of just in time when it comes to being able to produce these resources for producers. Um, the one in the middle is really geared towards more the interior, but anyone with grazing livestock would benefit from having a look at it. And it specifically deals with managing fuel on the farm to reduce wildfire risk. Um, and then on the right, there's one around pests and pollinators. So looking at, at what sort of research is needed and, and what farmers can do to identify pests, new pests in particular on their property, on their farms. So this just gives you kind of a, a broad stroke of, of what is out there. There's, there's tons of resources. It's hard to sort of choose, um, but there's uh, some great resources for everyone. So I'll just end with sort of putting it all together. Um, you know, I think it's quite clear that climate change is here and it's not going away. It will change from year to year. There might be some years that feel relatively quote unquote normal and some years that are essentially a disaster for agriculture. The, I think, trick will be to be able to be um, flexible and be able to, to accept that volatility essentially. Regenerative agriculture and the associated ecosystem services that it can support provide a way that we can guide our on-farm activities moving forward to become more resilient. Um, and also, we likely can become resilient to some of these changes, but we certainly can't become climate proof. I think everyone's going to be affected. Um, everyone probably has to some extent already, but that won't change. We will all be affected by climate change. And so being prepared is key. And that's why I like these adaptation uh, solutions rather than just focusing on mitigation or reducing carbon. I think we need to accept that it's that it's happening. And so we need to be as prepared as we can. It's looking more and more like insurance won't be always around to um, help out producers, particularly in the face of a disaster that keeps reoccurring. And then I will always go out with this message that healthy soil and water is really the best technology that we have for climate resilient farming. Um, thanks very much. I'm hoping that we can continue the conversation. I do feel that collaboration and partnerships are critical in everybody becoming more climate resilient. So I'm just going to leave you with my contact information. This is the, our website. We're on Twitter and Instagram as well. And I'll put my email in the chat. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing and I'm open to any questions anyone might have. Great. Thank you, Ayani. Um, yeah. Does everyone, does anyone have any questions around um, climate friendly farming uh, or adaptation um, or I guess questions related to mitigation or adaptation um, for Ioni, feel free to type into the chat. I just put my email address in there too. I guess I could ask a question of everybody. Um, like who in the audience is farming right now and, and has anyone had any specific impacts on their farm from climate change in, the, in recent years or are they concerned about any climate change impacts in terms of water um, availability or, or wildfire or flooding? You can also just unmute yourself if you want. You don't have to turn your video on. How long, so there's a question in the chat. How long does regenerative agriculture bring, bring back rainfall to areas with drought? Okay, so that's a great question. So it's not gonna sound like a great answer, but the answer is really, it depends. So it's not so much that regenerative agriculture will bring rainfall back, but it's more that regenerative agriculture will retain moisture in the soil longer. So rather than having soil dry out or plants wilt, um, farms that have undertaken regenerative agricultural 
practices will be much better at keeping water in the soil. So when, especially when we're talking about using compost or mulch or low till or no till practices um, on fields, those are some ways that we can make sure that the moisture in the soil is retained so that the plants can use the soil, the soil moisture instead of it evaporating essentially. Thank you, um, Ioni, for your answer, and thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I, uh, to answer your question previously, um, I was volunteering at a an urban farm um, in Vancouver. Um, it's called Farmers on Fifty Seventh. Oh yeah, and yeah. So the um, previous season, we had an, a huge issue, as you all know, from the heat wave, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't have much rain throughout really the entire July, I would say probably even uh, a little bit like June, July, very, very minimal rainfall and maybe even half of August we didn't. And so we had to really like jack up the irrigation system. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, on the few days that we did have the heat wave, we had to um, check on the plants pretty much all day, every day and make sure they were covered. And um, I guess are there any um, thoughts or notes on your end about heat waves or you know increased um, temperatures like that in the area? Yeah, one one project that we worked on this past year is working with the greenhouse industry, um, particularly in Greater Vancouver. And I'm not sure the irrigation source for your urban farm, but most of the greenhouse industry relies on city water. So. Um, tap water essentially, and that um, the Metro Vancouver, so any any local government within Metro Vancouver is beholden to the Metro Vancouver Drinking Water Management Plan. And within that plan, it states that if they are in a stage four drought, that um, water cannot be used for agriculture anymore or to ed for edible plants, essentially. So here where I'm based on the Sunshine Coast, that's already happened a couple times in the summertime is that farmers have been cut off from being able to use water for irrigation purposes because of droughts. So that's an issue that is becoming more and more um, acute and more and more frequent. And so when we worked with the greenhouse industry, it was a matter of discussing what are some alternative water supplies that they could rely on. And so looking at everything from rainwater capture and storage to uh, if feasible in more rural areas, is there an opportunity to look at groundwater and well water? I think that uh, we may not have a heat dome sort of effect every year, but we're likely to have drought more and more every year because um, you know, the, the heat dome was short lived and it was very strong, but what we're seeing also is sort of these uh, longer term, you know, just less precipitation resulting in drought towards the end of the summer because there's just no water left. So I think it's um, a really smart idea for everyone who's got farms to consider an alternative irrigation water source so that they're not relying only on city water because there's a good chance at a certain point the city, the local governments will um, make it so that it's restricted for only residential use. So they will prioritize people first, obviously. So. Great, thank you. Um, I was also wondering if you have any um, questions or if you have any sort of tips around implementing um, no till or low till. Um, I know that there are some concerns around kind of in increased uh, weed presence um, or there's just kind of, I've heard that brought up as sort of a challenge related to the technique but yeah if you have any tips for folks thinking of implementing it um but not sure where to start yeah depending on the size of the farm operation um one thing that can work really well are woke covers or soil covers so that you're you're blocking up the ability for weeds to become established because you're blocking out um air and light essentially so you're making it so that you're 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 restricting that plant growth at times of the year where you don't need the plant growth but you don't also want to be tilling so that can be one way to get around it um there's also other mechanisms of of like either mechanical weeding so not necessarily tilling but actually using specific equipment that can do the weeding without disru disrupting the soil too much and then the age-old answer is to do manual weeding which nobody wants to do 
Um, but, you know, depending on the size of the operation, it often is actually more effective and it can be the best way to do it if you're not interested in using chemicals, of course, which most people are trying to get away from as well. Um, that being said, there are some um, there are some applications of certain chemicals that are approved by the, you know, COABC, the Certified Organic Association of BC that are that are fairly benign to the environment, but actually work well against weeds. So it's working um, with the with the land that you have <laughs> rather against it, rather than against it. But the COABC website does have some good links to those sorts of solutions as well. Yes, it can be very tedious and weeding. And, and you know, that brings me to another topic that isn't directly related with climate change, but it's something we're seeing everywhere is that it's really hard to find farm labor. Um, so, so even just finding anyone to do the work, and I think that's across the board in British Columbia right now in a lot of different sectors, but particularly in farming, it's hard to find people to do manual labor, especially. Yeah, and um, I guess I was, are you aware, you mentioned, I know, uh, Oh, what is it called? I always forget the name of the Dave Zender program. <laughs> oh, the Farmland Advantage. Yeah. Farmland Advantage. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, are there, so through that program, farmers can access uh, some sort of either compensation or resources to help them kind of adapt. And then, you know, there's other programs like the Environmental Farm Plan. Yeah. Um, are there other kind of resources or any grants that you're aware of that well, farmers can? Yeah, that's a good question. I just put the link to Farmland Advantage in the chat. So Environmental Farm Plan and Farmland Advantage operate a little bit complementarily, com complementarily, but different from one another. So the Environmental Farm Plan works such that farmers volunteer to want to be a part of it um, and a, a planning advisor will come to the farm and, and walk around and meet with the farmer and essentially do an inventory of actions that could be undertaken on the farm to um, to make it more environmentally friendly and there's no commitment required on the part of the farmer there's no sort of regulatory or legal interaction it's just simply a conversation and a checklist that gets developed um, and provided to the farmer if the farmer does want to undergo those changes and and make that make those infrastructure upgrades and a lot of time they they will be eligible for some cost sharing agreements from the province the province would pay up to 50 percent for some of the work to be done um, the difference with the farmland advantage program is that the farmland advantage areas are selected by a committee of researchers and local organizations and indigenous communities to figure out how to prioritize which areas um, require the most um, high priority ecosystem protection so whether it's riparian areas or grasslands those are the two big areas that we worked on this year and then we will go and directly contact farmers who are found within those specific priority areas and ask them if they want to participate. Again, it's voluntary, nobody's required to participate, but for Farmland Advantage, you get paid um, to maintain the restoration work that's undertaken on your farm. And that restoration work is also paid for by the program. Thanks for that, Georgia. Yeah, that's the Environmental Farm Plan link. So all these programs are now, just as of this year, actually, it's new, um, being housed under the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC. So it's kind of a one-stop shop now for producers to find out that kind of information, which is great. Okay, great. Any other questions? Hi, Ioni. I am, I'm a Brit, as you can probably hear from my accent, but I work at Cropthorn Farm um, in okay. the Valley. With, yeah, I think you probably know Lydia. Lydia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure her dad, David, is a legend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I um, used to work in the UK as a kind of uh, a farm environment advisor, um, putting farmers in touch with funding, um, like the kind of resources that you've mentioned. Um, and I was wondering if you are a farmer, um, and you are thinking about what you can do on your farm and you think you've kind of already doing what you can and you're making the most of those resources, what kind of monitoring would you recommend 
doing to kind of check that you're keeping on track so i don't know whether like you would recommend soil testing water quality testing is that something that you can do easily over here are there good kind of indicator species that it would be good to look out for if you're um if you're restoring some of your riparian areas um and things like that so more kind of i guess day-to-day -day stuff that you can yeah. just think about <laughs> that's a great question so a lot of those answers would actually be provided through that environmental farm plan assessment um, process itself but specifically specifically to answer your questions it is not that hard to do soil testing and water testing here there are a few labs in particular that are well suited and well known within the ag sector the bc ministry of agriculture website i believe is um, pretty good at listing those i can put you in touch with a couple that i'm familiar with um, I don't think you need to do that exhaustively, like multiple times a year or anything, but it's sort of nice, particularly if you're, if you're noting any changes, right, like on the farm over time and you want to get a sense of whether or not it, you want to rule something out, for example, through soil and water testing, it can't hurt to do that. Um, and then in terms of the environmental farm plan, why I really suggest doing that is because it provides you almost like a scorecard. Um, and you know, you asked about certain indicator species for riparian areas. So the environmental farm plan is really good at bringing in those, there's like riparian health workbooks that they speak to. All of that information, I mean, you don't have to do the environmental farm plan to access that information. All of those workbooks are available publicly online. Um, I can provide Georgia with some of those links so that she can send them out to the group afterwards. But it, it's sort of nice to do the environmental farm plan because you get someone who's familiar with the region and, and can answer some questions. And like I said, there's no commitment. You don't have to follow through with any of the things they suggest, but it provides an opportunity to bounce some ideas off of, off of them and some questions as well. But yes, um, all those things that you asked about do exist and they're available online mostly. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Georgia, if you can pass that on, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I definitely will. Yeah, that would be really, really great. I know with soil testing, I feel like there is a lot of, um, even though there are, there's a lot of different options, I think people are often overwhelmed by the different options and not sure which are sort of recommended. So that would be great, Amy. Yeah, I'll send you, um, they're kind of old school. They don't have a website, but, but the, um, there's a young agrarians link to it. So Pacific Soils Analysis, they're just based in Richmond and they just have a really good reputation. Um, they're kind of no fuss, no musts, and you can call them. I just put the link there in the chat and talk to them and they will walk you through sort of whatever sort of testing they think you need and they won't try to upsell you on anything fancy. <laughs> and they're really good at helping to interpret the results because because even myself with a background in soil science, when sometimes I see the printouts of the Excel spreadsheets and the results from soil tests, it's like, holy smokes, how are we supposed to actually like figure out what to do with this information? And they're really good at at explaining what the results mean. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I think that's what Art has recommended as well, Art Bombi. Yeah, yeah, they're really well known. Um, I also was wondering if you could share any, like, if you could do, I know this doesn't quite make sense because every farm is, so different, but sort of top strategies for um, mitigating emissions related to uh, agriculture, if you could mm -hmm. share some information about that. Yeah, that one organization that I mentioned, the National Farmers um, for Climate Change Solutions, they're they're doing some really important work around best practices and policy development for, because that's more on the mitigation side, right? So we can talk about at, Adaptation is more my kind of thing where we look at practices we can do to actually like figure out how we're going to be resilient in the face of climate change. But if we're talking about reducing our, our climate um, impact, if we're talking about reducing carbon, then that's more mitigation. And so some of the things that they've pointed to is, you know, fairly obvious, like moving away from fossil fuel based equipment like tractors and and big diesel trucks and things like that, moving away from chemical fertilizers, um, uh, moving away from anything that's that's more um, synth synthetic, 
rather than based on biofuels or based on electric um, engines and things like that. So those are the key ones, but to be honest, they're not, I mean, aside from the, the fertilizer one, like moving to electric equipment can be pretty expensive. Um, and so we need to see more, I think, from different levels of government incentives, economic incentives, monetary incentives for the farming community to do that. I think that's coming. Um, I was really heartened to see in the budget just a couple of days ago in the federal budget, there was a whole section on nature-based climate solutions as well as um, not just the budget, but the climate change plan as well. So they're starting, the governments are, I think, starting to put two and two together finally, which is great. Um, yeah, Bowie's got a question here about biogas. So there, there's opportunities for biogas. What I am not that sure about is scalability. So in British Columbia, we don't have the same way that there is in Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario, parts of Quebec. We don't have the amount of intensive livestock operation that exists in some of those parts of Canada. And so we don't have the same amount of manure essentially being generated. And so you need to have we looked at it, I think, in Abbotsford, you need to have a couple of different dairy farms located in close proximity, all producing quite a bit of manure in order to reach that scalability and capacity for biodigesters and biogas generators. So I think the um, it's really popular in Europe and it's really popular in parts of the States and parts of Canada. But in British Columbia, the types of farming we have is much more small to medium scale. Um, so I think we're going to have to wait maybe we'll see it in pockets in parts of the province like the Fraser Valley but I think by and large we'll have to wait until the technology is better suited to smaller farms and smaller amounts um, that's my best guess on that yeah an interesting stat I looked at dairy farming um, for a few years ago for a project I was doing and um, dairy farms just across the border in Washington state, the average number of cows on a dairy farm is 1,200. And in British Columbia, like even right across the border in Abbotsford, for example, the average number of dairy herd is uh, just under 300 cows. So the 300 compared to 1,200, it's a huge, huge scale difference. Um, and partly that, I mean, it gets complicated, but partly that's because we're a supply managed and a quota system in Canada. So um, farmers get kind of better return for their investment on their farm, and they don't need to necessarily have that massive scale up in terms of number of animals just to make a profit. Um, but because of that, we don't have the the kind of non-point, the sort of point source fertilizer manure kind of generation that they have in some parts of the States. You'd have to kind of combine farms here in Canada. Another question from Charlotte is a way of measuring estimating emissions. Yes, this is a really interesting question. So her question is about whether or not there's a way to measure carbon sequestration or carbon emissions. This is great work that's, um, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of motivation to get this kind of technology going right now. Um, everything from work being done at UBC with folks like Sean Smuckler, who's also the chair of that ACARN group that I mentioned earlier. There's lots of collaboration going on across Canada right now on this. There are ways to measure it, but right now um, it's fairly expensive. It's fairly lab-based. It's not so much in situ. There are some things that are, that are being done, and I think there's great promise that that will really ramp up quickly in short order. Um, the thing with carbon, though, is that in order to see measurable change in soil carbon over time and being able to relate that back to specific on-farm practices, you're looking at generational timeline. So you'd really need to be able to measure that same farm for like 30, 40, 50 years before you would actually see a change that you could mark back to something specific that you might've done on the farm. And as you can imagine with funding, specifically government funding, we're seeing it roll out in like, you know, three, four, five years at the most kind of. Um, so it's tricky to get that funding agreement or funding arrangement that will allow for that kind of research to happen over that time frame. 
Interestingly enough, in the United States, they're doing a better job of it through the US Department of Agriculture and US Department of Conservation. They partner with organizations like Ducks Unlimited, and they look at securing parts of farmland that have um, ecosystem value, high ecosystem values, and they're measuring carbon um, in those soils over that long time frame, 20, 30, 40 years. So Canada has a bit of a ways to go, but there's some really strong promise, and UBC is actually leading the way through Sean's Smuckler's group, his um, his group is called, I think it's the Sal Lab. Sal. The, yeah. Yeah. Sal. yeah, he's doing quite a lot of work. So, so yes, my answer is sort of yes and no. Yes, it exists. It's not that easy to use on a small farm basis, but I think it's going to, I think that's going to change. I think there's a lot of motivation to have that technology available really soon. Yeah, I did my, I didn't do a research-based master's. I did a project-based master's, but I did it on sort of that topic with Sean's help. Um, so I looked at some of the data on that and some of the estimates. Um, there's a lot of research around like soil organic carbon in Canada, but not that much for BC. A lot of it is on the prairies, which makes sense. Um, but uh, I can share my conclusions. Do you have any, do you have different share. insights to share? Or was it kind of similar what you concluded? I just was trying to open up my, my, <laughs> my paper. Your executive I summary? <laughs> pretended I have ignored it ever since I finished it. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I remember from one of the students that uh, one of Sean Smuckler's students Sid Paul published his PhD oh, yeah. around, I think, remote sensing. Um, that might be interesting for you to look at, Charlotte, because one, one of the big findings, which is not surprising, is that, um, I mean, they'd also talk about some of the values. So that might kind of help provide some perspective of soil organic carbon um, and looking at different types of land use. The, the tricky part is, like one of the biggest takeaways is always just we sort of need to prevent the development of land <laughs> like that's yeah, the big way to prevent emissions from agriculture is by just not developing land further um which is always tricky because there may be trade-offs like is that food going to be produced someplace else but i think like it's interesting to hear about how it's sort of implemented Ioni, like you're saying, where there are groups which are kind of identifying these high uh, like value areas with or areas that provide a lot of ecosystem services and prioritizing those areas to potentially um, keep out of production. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that I can a, that's a whole job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> mm -hmm. And I can here, send you my report if you're interested, and you can look at it or not. And I, I'll put a link to um, to Sean's group slab there. Yeah, Sid Paul does really good work in that area too. I remember reading some of some of those papers, and the remote sensing thing does show a lot of promise. But again, it's it's one of those, those things. It's like I would love to see a tool and maybe it exists and I'm not aware of it, but I would love to see a tool that like a farmer can just buy for under a hundred bucks and like set it up on their farm and, you know, measure the, the amount of carbon in their soil in different places, almost like a soil moisture reader. And then be able to kind of track that over time with um, like something simple, like a GPS unit. So, you know, you're kind of relatively in the same area over time. Cause it'd be cool to see that in a healthy riparian area versus like where you were growing corn versus, you know, where the livestock are grazing or something. So I think it's coming. I'm hopeful. Yeah, I think so. It's true. It's hard because it's just right now it's so technical. It's not mm -hmm. that accessible. Yeah. Can you get, um, sorry, another question for me. <laughs> um, if you wanted to measure your soil organic carbon here um, or soil organic matter, can you get that done as part of a regular soil test? Because that's what we always used to advise in the UK, but then it all gets quite complicated with different ways of testing organic matter. 
so we ended up just using it as a proxy um, yeah you can, but i don't do know whether it's kind of advised you usually. can definitely do that no through that pacific soils analysis for example they'll do like a standard agricultural soil test and they'll give you the percent organic matter i think the carbon stuff it might be an add-on package but you can do total carbon organic carbon uh, and inorganic carbon i believe that's cool so then i guess with the long-term research that you were suggesting if you had or kind of signposting if you then had a projection of how much you could potentially expect it to change and you might be able to project some sort of expectations for sequestration in the future hopefully <laughs> yeah, especially if you start to layer on that idea of like um, not converting land. So we've looked before at different types of agriculture being more conducive to sequestering carbon. So, so say, for example, in the Okanagan, lands that were once forested, then become grazing lands for livestock, and then get converted to be uh, vine crops, like for grapes or apple orchard. Like you can imagine that there's this like change, right? And the um, in the soil organic carbon and the soil carbon um, stores. And so it's interesting to look also at how different types of agricultural activity have different impacts on soil carbon. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a yeah. whole breaking world and I'm not an expert in that at all, but <laughs> it's interesting to think about. I just um, found Sid's paper and we'll send awesome. it. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing in terms of like agricultural emissions, I remember as far as trends across Canada is definitely um, like the increased use of kind of nitrogen based fertilizers. And that's like a, a growing source of emissions and nitrous oxide, I think, is the most powerful greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas like maybe 300 times as powerful as carbon. Um, mm -hmm. So I think just because of changes to the sort of cattle industry, they were seeing emissions. There's still, you know, a lot of emissions from uh, like methane emissions from cows, but they were seeing that sort of on the decline, whereas nitrous oxide emissions were still increasing. I think that's right. what was reported in the last census hmm. um, data. But I feel like the farmers that we typically talk to are probably not using a lot of nitrogen fertilizers anyways, or synthetic fertilizers. Yeah. Well, that's one thing, you know, so this is something that I keep thinking about, and I know we're out of time, but just as a closing comment, these sessions are great. The research is great. The farmland advantage stuff is great. The environmental farm plan stuff is great, but it's all preaching to the choir. And so one thing that I'm still struggling with is how do we get to everyone out there who doesn't either care or have time or believe that it's important. So that I think can go, I think that next step in terms of like bringing people into the conversation is going to be just as important as anything else, because if you're here, it means you already care probably, and you're probably already doing a lot of the things that need to be done. Yeah, especially the things that are sort of manageable to implement like mm -hmm. on an individual level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks um, you guys for coming. Yeah, and if you have any last questions, feel free to chime in. Um, otherwise, I will share uh, any slides and um, the recording and some resources. Um, and I'll probably do that on Friday. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions in the meantime as well. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much, Ioni. That was really great. Thanks, you guys. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.